Welcome back. It is Wednesday, July the 17th. Uh, it's the Will and Jack Show. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Will, you had a visitor from... From France. France. Uh, he's my brother, actually. I, he's, I mean, he's not really my brother by blood, but I lived for two years in France, and I lived in a part of the time in a family during that whole time. And uh, so I had a mother and a father and uh, two brothers and a sister, and this is the youngest brother. And I hadn't seen him. I saw him once in the 90s in France when I went to visit, but I didn't really get to talk to him. I saw him at a get-together. But this time he flew, he was teaching a class for Air Canada on uh, some stuff for pilots for, because they're, they're new problems for pilots uh, with all the instrumentation and they're having to do some things to make, to make things work better for pilots and, and get around physical limitations. So anyway, he was teaching and he just jumped on a flight over here on that little Pacific uh, from Vancouver. Yeah, from yeah. Vancouver, and uh, we spent the whole day talking, and then he went back. And the thing is, is that he, the thing that was so interesting to me is that he w is an accidental doctor, and he, he went into the military service. Uh, his father was a general in the Air Force, and he became a doctor because he, he wanted to be a pharmacist, but they said, well, we're not having any pharmacists this year, so you're a doctor. And he <laughs> finished medical school, and he practiced for six years, but he said, in the French army, where he was in the in the service, he uh, he had to do things like he'd go on house calls, and they'd say that somebody they'd call and say that somebody was sick, but he really was expected to treat their dog or something. It was just, I mean, he told me so, there were kind of funny things that he told me. But anyway, he really didn't want to be a doctor. He really wants to be in research, and his current project is to look at how AI, artificial intelligence, is going to change our society. Uh, because he says that, you know, we're not really thinking about this. It's, it's already affecting us and things that these machines are learning and we're teaching them things and we don't know, <laughs> we don't know where it's going. And you can see that. You can see where, how that, that works. So this folds into all the, the things that, that we're talking about is who's manning the, you know, who's at the tiller, who's at the, at the rudder, who's steering the ship. And right now it's corporations and uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a situation that we're in where we're not, we've become less important. People have become less important. As David was saying, the, you know, there are fewer jobs and they're, they're just, the, the machines are taking yeah. over the jobs. So what are we going to do? Well, David mentioned uh, artificial intelligence and so did you. Yeah. But artificial intelligence depends on a super high level of technology that we've managed to create. Yes. But that level of technology depends on the mining and the resource extraction and basically the destruction of the planet. If we don't have that, we can't have the technology that allows for artificial intelligence. So given the fact that I think in the next decade, you know, 10 years from now, people are gonna be fighting to keep civilization alive, because of the environmental and social and economic breakdowns that seem to be coming, I don't, I'm not sure if artificial intelligence is going to be somewhere that we're going to be still thinking about. We're going to be more floundering in the water trying to keep afloat. Or maybe I'm completely wrong, I don't know. The thing is that we have to think about it. I mean, the main thing is nobody really knows what's going to happen. And, and we have to think about some of the consequences of the... Of the uh, motions and the things that we're setting in motion today and I think that's a that's a he's a, he's got a good point that you know an example of this is I think is 5G I mean 5G is being deployed to make to make it easier for computers to communicate to make the bandwidth and wider for people who don't know what 5G is it's a new well it's a new si wireless uh, yeah, system yeah it's a new uh, pro it's not really a new protocol it's a new specification for how uh, signals are to be managed, how, how the, the total infrastructure of connectivity is managed. And it, it consists of a new frequency band of, uh, or several new frequency bands of radio usage, but it also, the, the cells are smaller, the, the coverage is smaller, so they're everywhere. So it's, yeah, so there's gonna be transmitters basically on every block. Right, but the decision to do that is the decision, the decision to do that is coming from corporations because corporations say, look, if we do this, we'll make a business plan and we'll make money. And then it's presented to the government and the government likes it because it gives them more taxes. And it, they see it as being, 
able to, able to help with you on that one. The really? government likes it because they do what they're told by the corporations. Well, yeah, that's that's true to some extent. I mean, but but still, there have there are decisions made. I mean, if some if a corporation came in and said, "Hey, we just want to do something ridiculous," they, they would stop it. No, they wouldn't. Well, it just depends. I mean, yeah. the whole I, I mean, the whole thing is driven by money, point. though. I mean, it's driven yes. by money. It's, yes, a, it's driven it, by money. If you, it doesn't matter. You make a business plan, right? So BC Hydro made a business plan to show how their dam is going to be paid, right? Yes. Okay, but the point is that the business plan doesn't take into account all the changes in technology that are happening in an artificial intelligence. So the business plan, the the government says, yeah, we want this. We want this business plan because we're. We see that this is the, the way that things have always gone, or the way that things were developed in the 20th century. This electric power, it was developed by Nikola Tesla in the early part of the century, and uh, his, his generators, his alternators are still basically the way things run. And now Maybe things you can are different. Say, can you say a few words about Nikola Tesla? Because I think a lot of people don't know him, but he really was one of the great... Yeah, he was a, he was a genius. He was responsible for... I don't know anything about Nikola well, Tesla. Well, he was, he was uh, I think he was uh, Croatian, and he came to the United States after he uh, graduated from college, and, and he was an electrical engineer, and he, he invented most of the things that make our life easy right now. I mean, he, yeah. he put the the power plant in at Niagara Falls, and uh, it's an AC generator. Edison was developing DC, which doesn't work over long distances. So Tesla developed long distance transmission lines, uh, the transformers that work all of that, and a lot of other things too. There, he did a lot of a lot of inventions, and he just wasn't as as uh, business like. No, he wasn't. He 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 worked with, for example, he had a, a deal with George Westinghouse. He designed AC motors, and George Westinghouse produced them. And he had a, I think he had a dollar a horsepower royalty on the motors that, that uh, Westinghouse was making. And Westinghouse got in some financial trouble, so he asked Tesla to forgive the, the royalties. And so he did. So he didn't collect any royalties anymore, despite the fact that, you know, the world is populated with motors that Tesla designed. And he designed these things in his head. He could make them run in his head. So yeah. it's really interesting. I loved him when I was a little kid. I would go to the library and read about him for hours. And I built Tesla coils when I was, I don't know, I built my first one when I was 10 and I put it in a science fair. Uh, he's really a genius and he's not, he's not as uh, famous as Thomas Edison, but I think he's coming back. I noticed a lot of things on Facebook about Tesla's inventions. And he invented a, a tremendous number of uh, things that we don't use yet. <laughs> so that we don't use yet, wow. Right. wow. Yeah. So, uh, it's very interesting to read through his patents and his papers. I used to have them all. Anyway, let's get back to uh, Sylvain. Sylvain started. Uh, uh, Sylvain is the guy. He's my France. friend from yeah. France. Yeah, and uh, it was really interesting to talk to him because he's uh, he's interested in all these different things that that I'm interested in. I mean, we talked about uh, modeling, hearing, and the. Uh, Spatial location, how you locate things with your ears when you hear a sound, how do you know where it is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are all sorts of things studying that, and, it, and it, it, this has all been only made possible recently by computers. You know? The human body is truly amazing. I mean, even and, something as simple as that, you hear a sound and you can pretty much tell where it's coming from. I yeah, mean, something and, and he's so saying, simple we don't even think of breathing, for God's sake. Yeah, he was telling me all these things about how your brain is constantly trying to help you and it's trying to make sense out of the, out of the outside world. And one of the main things they're working on, he's, he's uh, working on too, is um, direct interface with the brain. So the, he said they started out, they put a, a probe into a chimp's brain and they taught the chimp that, they, they taught him to, to uh, get a banana, to reach his hand and get a banana and something like that. And, and then they've tied his arm so he couldn't, reach, but they can they still do detect. horrible things to animals. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that, but right. he, he learned very quickly to just think and get the banana. So if he just thought it, he, he could get the banana, yeah. yeah. And then they had a, a guy who was a paraplegic from Afghanistan, um, you know, he was in the service. I don't know whether he was American or Canadian, but anyway, they asked him if he'd like to volunteer for this project where they would uh, implant something in his brain, and then he would be able to work. He doesn't have any arms or legs, so he uh, can't do anything. But he learned within a half an hour after the operation how to, how to move the uh, articulated arm and grab yeah. something, the robotic arm. So they're making great progress in that. So, so the thing is, is that Sylvain said this opens up all these, this area of, uh, of making us into superhumans with this technology. 
And, and we have a basic, we had a basic disagreement in our conversation because he's a, he's a scientist and complete materialist, and he sees this as an augmentation of our human abilities, and I just see it as training. I mean, I think that we're capable, we're natively capable of, of um, telepathy and clairvoyance and all these things, but we just have been dumbed down and we don't know how to use it. But it's coming back out. If you watch shows like Sense8 on Netflix, uh, that's a... The, you know, the, the directors of the, the producers of the Matrix movie, people are waking up to their telepathic abilities and all of a sudden they realize, and I mean, I, I am experiencing that with my wife. So I, we, we say stuff so often now, the same, we know we're connected. And that's what I think is happening is we're being trained by all this technology that we're creating to be a different way. And he's much more, he's not as sanguine as I about it. He thinks that, we're, that we may have a lot of trouble with technology <laughs> doing things that we don't want it to do. But I, I just see it as, as training, really. I think that our consciousness has been so expanded by all the technology that we've created since my birth that we don't even, we're not even cognizant of it. I mean, just think of how different it is now when you want to find something out. You used to have to go to the library or buy a book, and now you just look on the Internet. That's very true, and yet when you read things that were written a hundred or two hundred years ago or even two thousand years ago in the times of the Romans and the Greeks they seem to have it all over us in terms of just the depth of the thinking so I agree with what you're saying but I'm not sure we've been going in the right direction well if you think about if you think about though that we've we've pushed some we've pushed our humanity in the corner so we've been on this planet for 5,000 years with wars. So we've all gotten to experience wars. And you know, nobody likes war, right? Nobody wants to fight in a war. Yes. But we've got this yeah. system set up. You know, Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage. So we, we come here and we do stuff and we learn. And wars enable us to learn. And doing the other things that we've done has enabled us to develop our, our uh, cortex. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, our neocortex, but there, there are more things than that going on. I mean, for example, I'm going through something. I don't know exactly what it is. Some people call it kundalini. When I first started feeling this stuff, this energy moving through my body, I was puzzled, and I tried for years to find out what was going on, and finally somebody told me what was going on. But is that now, what kundalini is? It's the energy movement okay. in your body. It's okay. the energy moving from the base of your spine up and activating all your chakras. And I mean, I didn't know anything about this. I was a, I was a... Pre company president, automation, I was involved in totally cognitive things, anything that was woo-woo. If somebody started talking about flying saucers, I'd head for the exits. So, but this is happening to me and I can't ignore it. And now on my Facebook, one of my Facebook groups, there are over 10,000 people in one and 5,000 in another one. So this is happening to people, even though it's not talked about. And it's happening in the movies. I mean, I see it, I see it in, the, in the movies too. There, if you watch uh, something like... Uh, uh, John Carter or I think it's Doctor Strange, some of these comic book movies, they're, they're all about chakras and energy, subtle energy and uh, these things. So it, maybe you and I in our, in our dotage aren't keying into this quite the way the kids are, but let me tell you, the kids are tuned into this stuff. I mean, they know about chakras, they know about subtle energy, uh, they know about these things. So the world is gonna change. We've got, we've got this artificial intelligence coming up and we've got superhuman abilities coming up, whether that comes through computation or comes through the development of our native skills, yeah. our consciousness, our consciousness increasing. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think that it's consciousness. We're, we're just going to go through something. We've seen this in past civilizations. We dig up these past civilizations where they kill each other off and then they disappear. Where do they go? What's going on? I think it's an evolutionary leap. I, I've been working on this now for 15 years, and I'm, I'm skeptical of things like this, but I, I have no other conclusion. I can't see the world the same way I even when I sat here in the chair with you five years ago. I, cannot, I can't see the world. I see the world as being perfect now. It's just absolutely perfect. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to, supposed to do. It's teaching us how to be, uh, be heart-centered instead of head-centered. We had to go through developing this head. I mean, I just read, for example... Will, we're going to have to leave it there. Okay. <laughs> All right. To be continued next time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Will. Thank you. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.